Chapter 7 Poirot Pays His Debts Outside, Poirot and I waited for the Scotland Yard detective. Do you remember me, Inspector Jap? My friend asked when Jap came out. It's Mr. Poirot, exclaimed the inspector. I remember we worked together several times, and you helped us catch some dangerous criminals. After Poirot had introduced me, Inspector Jap continued. This seems a very clear case of murder, he said. There I do not agree, replied Poirot. Jap looked at him closely. You've been here from the start, Mr. Poirot, which is in your favour, but it seems clear from the evidence that Mr. Inglethorpe murdered his wife. Have you come to arrest him? asked Poirot. Perhaps, replied Jap. Poirot looked at him thoughtfully. It is very important that you don't arrest Mr. Inglethorpe, he said. If you arrest him now, the case against him will fail at once. Was Poirot mad, I wondered? Surely there was too much evidence against Inglethorpe. I do trust you, Mr. Poirot, said the inspector. But can you tell me why I should not arrest Mr. Inglethorpe? I would prefer not to, Poirot said, but I know you need a reason. Are you going to Styles now? In half an hour, after I've talked to the coroner and the doctor. I will go with you. Call for me. I live at the last house in the village. At Stiles, I will prove to you that the case against Mr. Inglethorpe will not be successful in court, even if Mr. Inglethorpe himself will not tell you what he was doing. All right, said Jap. I can't see anything wrong with the evidence against him, but if you can... He left to talk to the coroner. What do you think, Hastings? asked Poirot as we walked back to his house. Why won't Mr. Inglethorpe tell us where he was? If he was buying the poison, what could he say? I replied. If I had murdered someone, I could invent an alibi, said Poirot. I laughed. <laughs> I'm sure you could. But why do you still think that Alfred Inglethorpe is innocent? Surely there is enough evidence against him. Yes, but that is the problem. There is too much evidence against him. And the evidence is so definite, so sure, as if it has been cleverly invented. By now we had arrived at Poirot's house. Imagine, he continued, that Alfred Inglethorpe wants to poison his wife. He openly goes to the nearest pharmacy and buys strychnine using his own name. He doesn't poison his wife that night, but waits until after he has had a violent argument with her that everyone in the house knows about. He doesn't defend himself or invent a good story to give himself an alibi. Surely no man could be so stupid. But I don't understand, I said. Neither do I, mon ami, he replied. It puzzles me. Me, Hercule Poirot. But if Inglethorpe didn't poison his wife, why did he buy the strychnine? I asked. He did not buy it, answered Poirot. Mr. Mace saw a man with a black beard like Mr. Inglethorpe's and wearing glasses and clothes like Mr. Inglethorpe's. 
Mr. Mace had only just arrived in the village, and he probably had not met Mr. Inglethorpe before. Remember that Mrs. Inglethorpe got her medicine from Coote's Pharmacy in Tadminster. Then you think, do you remember my second important point? That Mr. Inglethorpe wears glasses and strange clothes and has a black beard? Mr. Mace thinks that he sold the poison to Mr. Inglethorpe when really it was someone else dressed up to look like Mr. Inglethorpe with a beard and glasses. The murderer is trying to make it seem that Mr. Inglethorpe, who is already suspected of murder, bought the poison. You may be right, I said, fascinated by Poirot's words. But why won't he tell us where he was at six o'clock on Monday evening? I'm sure he will tell us if he is arrested, said Poirot. He probably has another reason for his silence. I was impressed by Poirot's opinion, though secretly I still wasn't sure if he was right. Do you now understand why Mr. Inglethorpe must not be arrested now? asked Poirot. Perhaps, I said doubtfully. With a sigh, Poirot changed the subject. What did you think about the inquest? he asked. The evidence of Lawrence Cavendish, for example. Do you think his mother was poisoned by her own medicine? The doctor said it was impossible, but it's something you might think if you didn't know about medicine. But Monsieur Lawrence studied medicine, didn't he? Yes, he did, I said with surprise. That's strange. Poirot nodded. His behavior has been strange from the start. He is the only person in the house who might recognize strychnine poisoning, but he still says that his mother had a heart attack. And today he suggests that his mother's medicine might have caused her death, even though he knows that is ridiculous. It is very strange, I agreed. And Mrs. Cavendish, continued Poirot, she certainly overheard more of the argument that afternoon, and yet she says nothing. Is she protecting Alfred Inglethorpe? It seems very unlikely, I said. But at least, he went on, she agreed with Dorcas about the time of the argument. It was definitely about four o'clock. Poirot had been sure that the argument had been at four-thirty, not four o'clock. But Dorcas was sure that it was four o'clock, an hour before Mrs. Inglethorpe had asked for tea. And now Mary had agreed with her. I looked at him curiously. I didn't understand why this was so important. We learned other strange things at the inquest, he continued. We learned that Mademoiselle Cynthia did not hear the table fall over in the room next door, but Mary Cavendish, on the other side of the house, did hear it. Cynthia must sleep very deeply, I suggested. It was strange, too, continued Poirot, that Dr. Bowerstein was passing Stiles so early in the morning. The coroner should have asked him what he was doing. He has trouble sleeping, I think, I said doubtfully. That does not explain it, said Poirot. I will keep my eye on the clever Dr. Bowerstein. When people do not tell the truth, I ask myself why. Well, 
At least both John Cavendish and Miss Howard told the truth, I said. One, perhaps, but not both, Poirot replied. I was shocked. But surely Miss Howard is always honest, I said. Poirot gave me a look that I didn't understand. He was about to speak, but just then we were interrupted by a knock at the door. It was Inspector Jap. I think everyone at Stiles was shocked when Inspector Jap arrived, although after the verdict of murder we knew that the police would investigate. I thought that now everything was real, and not just a bad dream. A person had been murdered in this house. Tomorrow the newspapers would say, Mysterious tragedy, wealthy lady poisoned. There would be photos of all the family. Things that we usually only read in newspapers were now happening to us. We all went into the drawing room, and to our surprise, it was Poirot, not Inspector Jap, who began to speak. Mesdames et Messieurs, said Poirot, we are all here because the shadow of murder is over this house. Mr. Inglethorpe, you are suspected of poisoning your wife. We were all shocked when we heard Poirot speak so openly. What a horrible idea, cried Inglethorpe, jumping up. I would never poison my dearest Emily. Do you still refuse to say where you were at six o'clock on Monday evening? asked Poirot. Speak! Slowly, Inglethorpe shook his head. You will not... Speak? asked Poirot again. No, I will not, said Inglethorpe. No one could really think that I poisoned my dear wife. Then I will speak for you, said Poirot. The man who bought strychnine in the village pharmacy on Monday the 16th was not Mr. Inglethorpe. At six o'clock that evening, Mr. Inglethorpe was walking with Mrs. Rakes near Abbey Farm. Five people saw them together. Since Abbey Farm is three miles from the pharmacy, Mr. Inglethorpe has a perfect alibi. Chapter 8 Fresh Suspicions there was a shocked silence. Jap was the first to speak. Are these witnesses telling the truth, Mr. Poirot? You must talk to them, of course, replied Poirot. Here are their names and addresses, but yes, they are telling the truth. I'm very grateful to you, Mr. Poirot, Jap said. He turned to Inglethorpe. But why didn't you tell us this at the inquest, sir? There was a horrible rumour, quite untrue, said Alfred Inglethorpe in a trembling voice. I didn't want any scandal. But if it wasn't for Mr. Poirot, you would have been arrested for murder, said Jap. I was stupid, admitted Inglethorpe. But, Inspector, you don't know what other horrible things people have been saying about me. He looked angrily at Evelyn Howard. Now, sir, said Jap, turning to John, I'd like to see Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom, please, and then talk to the servants. Don't worry, Mr. Poirot will show me the way. As we left the room, Poirot pulled me to one side. Quick, Hastings, go upstairs to the other side of the house and stand by the door. 
Don't move until I come. Then, turning quickly, he followed Inspector Jap. As I stood by the door, I wondered why. Every room except Cynthia's was on this side of the house. Was I to report who came or went? I waited for twenty minutes. Nobody came, and nothing happened. When Poirot returned, I told him I hadn't moved. You didn't see anything? Or hear anything? A loud noise, perhaps? No, I said. I'm not usually clumsy, but by accident I knocked over the table by the bed. He looked upset with himself. Don't worry. I said, as I looked out of the window. Oh, Dr. Bowerstein's here. I know you think he's clever, Poirot, but I still don't like him. It was funny to see him so muddy on Tuesday. I told him about the doctor falling in the river. Was Dr. Bowerstein here on Tuesday evening? asked Poirot, very excited. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't think it was important, I admitted. Not important? But Hastings, this changes everything. Everything. I had never seen him so excited. Come, we must go to Tadminster immediately, he exclaimed. Ask John Cavendish if we can use his car. Ten minutes later, we were driving along the road to Tadminster. Now, Poirot, I said, please tell me what this is about. Well, mon ami, now we know that Mr. Inglethorpe did not buy the poison, we must discover who did. Only you and Mary Cavendish, who were playing tennis, could not have bought the poison on Monday evening. Also, Mr. Inglethorpe said that he left the coffee in the hall. We must find out who gave Mrs. Inglethorpe her coffee or who was near it. You say only Mary Cavendish and Mademoiselle Cynthia did not go near the coffee. Yes, that's right. I was relieved that Mary Cavendish could not be suspected. Now that Alfred Inglethorpe has an alibi, continued Poirot, the murderer will be even more careful. Is there anyone you suspect, Hastings? I hesitated. I did have a wild idea. It sounds stupid, I said, but I don't think Miss Howard has told us everything. I know she was fifteen miles away, but in a car she could be here in half an hour. But I have checked, Poirot told me, that Miss Howard was working in the hospital all afternoon and evening. Oh, I said, but she is so sure that Inglethorpe is guilty. I think she would do anything to prove it. She might have burned the new will, thinking that it was in his favour. She hates Englethorpe so much. It seems unnatural. Perhaps she tried to poison him, and Mrs. Englethorpe was poisoned by mistake, though I don't know how. You are right to suspect everybody until you can prove that they are innocent. But Miss Howard would never poison Mrs. Inglethorpe on purpose, I said. She was devoted to her. That does not prove anything, said Poirot. You can pretend to love someone. And you are right to say that Miss Howard's hatred of Alfred Inglethorpe is, 
unnatural, though you are wrong about the reason. But I will not speak of my own thoughts. He paused. But Mrs. Inglethorpe's death does not benefit Miss Howard. The burned will was not in her favour, and there is no murder without a motive. I believed him, though I didn't know why he was so sure. So it wasn't Miss Howard, I sighed. I only thought of her because of what you said, that perhaps she wasn't telling the truth at the inquest. Poirot looked at me strangely. Then, for some reason, he changed the subject. Now, Hastings, there is something I want you to do. The next time you are alone with Lawrence Cavendish, say to him, I have a message from Poirot. Find the extra coffee cup, and you can stop worrying. What does it mean? I asked him. You know all the facts, said Poirot. You can find out what it means. I'll tell him, but it's all very mysterious. We had now arrived at Tadminster, where Poirot visited the pharmacy for a few minutes. When he came out, he told me that he had asked them to test the cocoa from Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom. But Dr. Bowerstein has done that, I said with surprise. And you yourself said that it didn't contain strychnine. Yes, but I wanted it tested again. And he would not say anything else. I was puzzled, but because he had been right about Alfred Inglethorpe's alibi, I was sure that he had a good reason for his actions. The funeral of Mrs. Inglethorpe took place the next day, and on Monday John told me that Mr. Inglethorpe was leaving Stiles and would be staying in the village. It'll make things easier, Hastings. We were wrong to suspect him, and we haven't treated him well, but I still don't like him. I don't care that he has mother's money— but I'm thankful that she couldn't leave him styles in her will. My father left the house to me after her death. Can you afford to stay here? I asked. Oh, yes. Lawrence will live here too, and we both have our share of our father's money. But it will be difficult. At breakfast that day we all felt more cheerful except Lawrence, who for some reason seemed sad and nervous. The newspapers, of course, had pages about the mysterious affair at Stiles. It seemed as if the whole country was talking about the murder. Reporters tried to enter the house, and people with cameras waited in the village. The police came and asked questions, but did not tell us anything. Did they have any idea who the murderer was, or was the case never going to be solved? After breakfast, Dorcas came to speak to me. I told Mr. Poirot that no one in the house had a green dress, she said, but I've remembered that there is a big wooden box in the attic, a chest where the dressing-up clothes are kept. I thought there might be a green dress in there. I'll tell Mr. Poirot, Dorcas. Thank you, I promised. Poirot and I went to look in the chest as soon as we could. It was a large piece of furniture, full of lots of different clothes. My friend didn't seem to think we would find anything, but at the bottom of the chest we discovered a big, black beard. Aha! exclaimed Poirot. 
he looked closely at the beard in his hands. It is new, he said, before putting it back in the chest. And it has been cut to look like Mr. Inglethorpe's beard. Once we were downstairs again, Poirot thanked Dorcas for telling us about the chest. Are the clothes inside used very often? Not very often now, sir, said Dorcas. Sometimes the family dresses up and does some acting. Mr. Lawrence is very funny, pretending to be a sort of Eastern king. And you wouldn't recognise Miss Cynthia, all dressed up as a prince or a thief. They're both very clever. And when he was an Eastern king, asked Poirot, did Monsieur Lawrence wear that fine black beard in the chest upstairs? He did have a beard, sir, replied Dorcas, smiling. It was made from my best black wool. If there's a proper beard in that chest, it must be new. So Dorcas doesn't know about the beard, said Poirot thoughtfully as we walked into the hall. It was a clever place to hide it. So we too must be clever. For this, I need the help of someone in the house. Someone who no one knows is working with me. What about John? I suggested. No, I don't think so. Here is Miss Howard. I will ask her. What do you want? said Miss Howard as we approached. I think she was still annoyed with Poirot for helping Alfred Inglethorpe. I'm busy. I would like to ask you a question, mademoiselle. Do you still think that Mrs. Inglethorpe was poisoned by her husband? I'll admit that he didn't buy the poison, replied Miss Howard, but I still think he did it. So you still think he did it, said Poirot. Hastings told me that the day he arrived, you said that if you were involved in a murder, you would know who the murderer was. Yes, I did say that, admitted Miss Howard. But you don't really believe that Mr. Inglethorpe is the murderer, said Poirot. You only want it to be him. Really, you think it is someone else? No, no, said Miss Howard wildly. How did you guess? My idea is impossible. It must be Alfred Inglethorpe. Poirot shook his head. I am mad to think of such a thing, continued Miss Howard. And I won't tell you, or help you to— She stopped. I only want you to watch, said Poirot. Yes, I am always watching, always hoping I am wrong. But if you are right, what will you do? asked Poirot. I don't know. I don't know. Miss Howard, said Poirot seriously, this is not like you. Yes, said Miss Howard quietly. You are right. She lifted her head proudly. I believe in truth and justice, whatever happens. And with these words she walked away. Poirot watched her go. That woman, Hastings, has a brain as well as a heart. You and Miss Howard seem to know what you are talking about, 
I said coldly. But I don't. Will you please tell me what's going on? Poirot looked at me for a moment and then shook his head. No, I won't tell you, he said. You know what has happened. You know the facts. This is just an idea. I was so annoyed that I said nothing. But I decided that when I discovered something interesting and important, I would not tell Poirot.